Hello, Lisa here. Welcome back to my channel and welcome to my June show and tell. If you are new to my channel, welcome. Uh, hi, uh, this is a very babbly video to come in on, but I hope you enjoy yourself while you're here. I like to make monthly videos that are kind of like recaps of what I've been up to, the tarot and oracle decks I've been using, books I've been reading, all that kind of stuff. But I tend to talk about a wide variety of topics uh, in this video. So uh, come on in, get comfy, get a snack. I usually talk for a while. Although I feel like my list isn't terribly long this month. So maybe, maybe this won't be as long as usual. We'll see. We'll see how it goes. In any case, I like to talk about all kinds of stuff, but I'm going to kick this off with memories as I typically do, because it's a great way to sort of help me remember the things that I've been up to in June. And other than I feel like just a lot of working and working on projects and recording videos and editing videos, I feel like June just kind of flew by. So in June, other than the fact that I spent one day terribly, terribly unwell, uh, other than that, it was actually a really great month with a lot of fun things that I was up to, but I was also really busy, so I feel like the month just flew by. But a couple highlights I wanted to mention in this space. First, uh, Peggy and I went on a double date with Rose. If you don't know who Rose is, Rose helps Peggy in her Etsy shop. And so Rose and her wife, Roxanne, and Peggy and I went and had this karaoke double date for Rose's birthday. It was a lot of fun. It was an a interesting kind of thing because I've done karaoke way back in the day, but usually it was at bars and you were really, really drunk. <laughs> That was just how it went. But this is a thing where you like rent a room and you, it's just you and your friends and it's, it's just, it's like private, really different, but it was a lot of fun. And we sang our hearts out. It was, it was just, it was silly. It was fun. I would definitely do it again. It was, it was a good time. The other fun thing that this kind of out of the ordinary that I got to do in June was I had an incredible astrology reading by Kyra Getchell. So I will link her website down below, but it was incredible. So we did a bit of a trade. She helped me test out some readings that I was planning to put it up in my shop for clients. I actually added a new reading. Um, I guess this is a bit of a segue, but I did a video talking about it, but I created a new spread called the unicorn's journey, which is really specific to sort of me and my love of unicorn lore and specifically of the movie and the book, the last unicorn by Peter S. Beagle. I created this spread and I also created an inner child spread, which I also made a video about in June, but in both cases, I wanted to test these readings out be before putting them up on my website for clients. And so Kyra very kindly helped me test those readings. And then in exchange, she offered me an astrology reading. And it was so much fun. I felt like I got to absorb a ton of information. Kyra is really, really passionate about what she does. She loves, loves astrology. And you can just tell she gets super, super excited about it. And it was a great experience. Um, I just, I would absolutely recommend her if you're interested in an astrology reading. She can definitely help you with your chart and kind of help you look at different aspects of your parts of your chart, aspects is a very specific thing, but she can help you with that too. But it was just fun. I, and I, I did that on the heels of some astrology studies of my own. So I felt like I was able to absorb more of the information and it was just a really good time. And she was incredibly generous with her knowledge and her time and everything. And it was a really, really great experience. So I definitely recommend Kyra if you are interested in getting an astrology reading. And she does some cool things with like astrology and tarot kind of intermingled, which you should check out also if that's the kind of thing that is up your alley. But it was a lot of fun and definitely a highlight of my June. Since I've been mentioning some youtube -y things, yes, I did do the Unicorn's Journey spread, and I also did an inner child spread that I shared during the Learn to Read Tarot with Me series. So I do this series on the channel where I share with you, I kind of break down a spread and do some sample readings to kind of show you how it can look to put cards together in a reading, because it's one thing to learn the meanings of the tarot, and it's another thing to try to understand how you can like string it all together and, and create like a cohesive reading out of it. So I used the Learn to Read Tarot with Me series for that. And in June, I also I shared this inner child spread that I'd created for my website for client work. And it's just meant to be a really accessible way to sort of connect with your inner child. That was a lot of fun to put together into a video and kind of break it down for you guys. And I did the same thing with the Unicorn's Journey spread, which is a more comprehensive, big general spread, a lot like a Celtic cross meant to kind of help you look at your journey, right? And kind of uh, look at all these different steps. And I'm going to do a terrible job of explaining it now, but I will refer you to the video, which I will definitely link in the description box down below for you or up in the cards or something. So other youtube -y things uh, I really, really enjoyed in June. First, Exploring Tarot is a channel that I really enjoy. And she did or started a series that's really doing basically a really, really, really deep dive into the Forest of Enchantment Tarot. And I have been 
soaking that series up. It has been so much fun to watch. She does just a, a small chunk of the, of the deck at a time and she goes through it and kind of looks at what the guidebook says and what she sees in the artwork and it's just very comprehensive and fun. I really love when content creators do series like that on one specific deck. It's a really fun way to dive in and like spend quality time with your deck alongside somebody else who's learning it. It's a really cool experience. So I will refer you to, I think if she has a playlist, I'll link the playlist down below. If I don't spot a playlist, I will link the first video in the series, but the channel is Exploring Tarot and it, it's just a wonderful series. So definitely check it out and check out her other content. She's somebody I really enjoy watching. Another YouTube favorite came about in this really fun kind of organic way. So you guys, if you've been watching my channel for a bit, you probably know that I do these occasional declutters on on my channel where I, I call it this or that. And essentially what I do in this, in this series is I sort of look through my collection at, and check in with myself about things I may be not using. And I look at other things that are competing with those things that I have. And I sort of put them up head to head and I try to decide, do I want both? Do I want only one? Which one? So it's kind of like putting these two things in competition with one another to decide which I want to keep basically. And I end up usually decluttering about half, sometimes even more than half of what is brought into that video. But before I film that video, I roll out polls here on the channel. So if you're a subscriber of the channel, then <laughs> Shayla, look at her. I just groomed her today. She's so cute. Uh, anyways, I, um, I do polls. So I ask the community and if you're subscribed, you'll see those polls show up in your feed. Uh, in community posts. But anyways, I pulled the community to find out if, if you were making the same decision between these two decks, which would you choose? And one of the pairings I was looking at was the Oracle of a Radiant Sun. I promise I'm getting to the point. Oracle of the Radiant Sun next to the Heavenly Bodies Oracle. And these are both astrology-based oracles. And I was deciding if I wanted to keep one or the other, basically. And I put the poll out and Wesley of 22 zines was like, oh my God, like you, like you can't get rid of Oracle of the Radiant Sun. Like here's why it's amazing. Actually, I'm going to go make a video <laughs> or I, I, I need to talk about this or I went and made a video or something. It turns out that Wesley had indeed made an excellent video all about the Oracle of the Radiant Sun. And it was, it was really well done. It was really fun to listen to Wesley uh, enthuse about uh, astrology and about the Oracle of the Radiant Sun. And actually, Wesley, if you watch this video, I would love to see more astrology content from you because that was super fun. But I loved that video. And in fact, I had that video in my mind when I was recording my this or that video. And it was probably the number one reason why I was like, Lisa, what are you thinking? Of course you need to keep the Oracle of the Radiant Sun. Sorry if that's a spoiler, but I did keep the Oracle of the Radiant Sun because of this video and because I was like, yeah, I haven't, I haven't really explored all of its possibilities yet. And it was a fun video. All of this to say, go check out Wesley's video on Oracle of the Radiant Sun. I will link it down below. Also, there are two channels I feel like I discovered in June. It could be that I discovered them before June, but I feel like I discovered them in June somehow. And I, I'll be darned if I could remember how I stumble on new channels. I don't know if sometimes it's because one of them does a VR to something I've done or I don't really remember how I just know that suddenly I'm watching these channels and they're in my feed all the time and I'm enjoying their content. So the two channels I want to mention that I sort of stumbled upon. Oh, now there's Bruno. <laughs> I'm sitting on my bed. So I just feel like they're like really close. Come here, buddy. Hi. And I got my other girl over here. Oh my God. Okay. Anyway. Um, Rumor Haven was one of the channels and the other channel was Red Velvet. I have been enjoying both of these channels so, so much. So I will link both of them down below, but they have both just come in and sort of freshened up my feed. And I'm always really excited when I find new content creators in this space that I gel with their content. I don't watch as much YouTube as I used to, but I still watch quite a bit. And it's always fun to discover new people and their takes on the tarot, not new people, new to me people and their takes on the tarot. Uh, I really, really enjoy that. So I've been really enjoying both of their channels. Rumor Haven, the most recent, re recent video I can remember of hers that I have watched. She was doing a, she's doing this series about what's in my, what's in my tarot bag or whatever. And it's like these like little mini collections within her collection of decks. And that's been really fun. So that would be a definitely a video I would recommend. And Red Velvet has been doing a bunch of VRs. And the thing that cracks me up about Red Velvet's channel is that when she closes out her videos, she's like, my mom's coming. I gotta go. <laughs> And it cracks me up every time. And I don't know why. I think it's just it's just such a fun and different way to end a video. I, I That would have never occurred to me in a million years. And I appreciate her and her take on tarot so much. And her deck selection in, that she has in, in her personal library of decks is so different 
from mine. And I think that's something I also really appreciate is watching people whose aesthetics are very, very different than mine. I don't know if you guys are that way, but I really enjoy being exposed to things that maybe I wouldn't seek out on my own and Red Velvet's great for that. So anyways, love both of their channels. And of course, what would YouTube faves be without telling you guys how much fun I had on the last Three Fat Readers? So we get together. Three Fat Readers is a collaborative channel with myself, Danny of Danny Mystic, and Dustin of Modern Metaphysique. And we get together about once a month for a live stream and we just talk about whatever the heck we feel like talking about. In June, we talked about our summer decks and it was just a lot of fun to compare notes and to kind of show the different decks that each of us felt like was summer themed or gave us summer vibes or sun vibes. It was a, it was a lot of fun and it's always a blast on those videos, those live streams. If you are not already subscribed to Three Fat Readers, definitely do that. It's really, really fun. And if you're subscribed and you click the bell and all that kind of stuff, then ideally you get notified. But typically we tend to get together on the last Sunday of the month, usually at about 9.30 a.m. Pacific time. So keep your eyes out and I will have a link to Three Fat Readers. I mean, I always have a link to Three Fat Readers in the description box or on my homepage. So you can always just click there and subscribe. But it's a big highlight of my month because I get to hang out with my buddies and like, talk tarot and like talk to all of you guys all at the same time. It's a good time. It's a party. It's great. So uh, catch it in July. We have reached the point in the video in which I'm going to talk about makeup, albeit this will be very short this month because I've only been working with a couple of things, but still my usual disclaimer applies. If makeup bores you to tears, please feel free to skip ahead in the timestamps to the next section of this video where I'll be talking about, I don't know, food or movies or TV or something. So anyways, let's talk about makeup. So there's only two things I have to highlight this month, but I, one of them I only used once. So uh, we're just gonna get it out of the way. I only painted my nails once in all of June. Um, I'm not sure what the deal was. I just was having a hard time finding the time to sit down and do it, uh, which is kind of telling. Sorry, I'm gonna ramble for a second. I have been feeling really, really busy and lit, not, not burned out, but definitely feeling like a lot was on my plate and I was really feeling that in June and this is actually something that I feel like is a bit of an indicator that I was not like making that up in my head because painting my nails on Saturday mornings, typically Saturday mornings, is a self-care thing for me and I just have not, did not make the time in June other than one time and I used this color um, which I'll talk about but it's just interesting because it's like hmm when I have less polish in the basket come show and tell time that tells me I haven't been doing my usual kind of like little mini me self-care, mini self-care, not mini me self-care. But anyways, I haven't made a lot of time for myself in that way in June. And this is just sort of like proof. <laughs> but anyways, I did paint my nails once in June and I use this gorgeous color called, oh gosh, am I going to be able to read it? Do I ever wear my glasses when I'm making these videos anymore? No, I always forget. Um... Dynamic Daisy, that was really hard work. <laughs> Dynamic Daisy. It is a really pretty hot pink color and it's the brand Nail Churl. This is a great polish brand. It's quick dry, it's vegan, it's bio-based um, and it doesn't have a lot of like the nasty chem chemicals in them or anything and they're really cheap and the colors are great and it goes on nice and it's easy to apply but it does this weird thing that none of my other polishes do is that it like peels. Like it when it decides to start chipping, it's just gonna come off in like large chunks. I have like four colors um, from this brand and they're all summer colors. So I tend to wear these a lot in the summer, um, but I love them. It's just, they, they don't, they seem to stay really well, but once they start to chip, it's just like they go all in on the chipping. So I don't, I mean, I've recommended these before because I find them really easy to use and they're great for like an affordable nail polish, but the chipping thing, you know why I think it bothers me? Because I have a really hard time not picking at my cuticles and my fingers and stuff. It's something I've done my whole life. I've gotten really good about it lately, but, and painting my nails is one of the ways I prevent it. But with this, when it starts to pin, like chip, then I wanna pick at the nail polish, which does not help when you're trying to break a habit. That's, that's what I'm gonna say about that. But it is a pretty color, this, this little dynamic daisy. So that's the nail polish I wore in June. But the makeup thing that I had the most fun with in June is I kind of challenged myself. I've got um, some pa palettes, eyeshadow palettes by Pat McGrath that I absolutely love. And so I wanted to challenge myself to, I'm kind of rotating through my eyeshadow palettes now. I kind of do it like I rotate my decks, right? So I'll try to work with a palette a few times before I move on to the next one. It just helps me to explore what it's possible to, what kind of looks I can make out of it for my eyes. In June, I used exclusively this palette. This is the Divine Love. Nope, not Divine Love, Divine Rose. It's called the, it's the Mothership palette, but it's the Mothership 
seven divine rose the original divine rose so these are the colors i'm going to try to hold them up without like blinding you so i'm not going to show you the mirror these are the colors let me duck my head so that it focuses on the shadow <laughs> can i do this uh yeah sort of anyways these are the colors um of my pat mcgrath palettes this one looks the most like kind of boring it's not at all boring like it's not at all boring it's gorgeous but i used this a lot in june and in fact i did an eyeshadow look I was playing with all kinds of different looks all throughout June with this and I had a ton of fun. There's Pat McGrath's eyeshadows have these like formulas that are really, really different and there are these four ones over on this side of the palette. They're all kind of baked and these three are all really unique. So this one, it looks white in the pan, but it's like, I don't know how to, it's like weirdly powdery, which I don't love, but it's kind of like, let's see if I can get my finger on camera. It's got this like pinky purpley, let me just, I always end up swatching colors on my hand. It, it's almost invisible, but it's it has this like effect. It's You know what it reminds me of? It reminds me of those funky colored highlighters. Do you see that? It's like got this sheen that's like kind of pink and kind of orangey and kind of gold. I don't know how to describe it, but it's a really cool effect. And then these other two, there's this really pretty just gold. I'm gonna just, how many colors am I gonna swatch? I don't know, we're gonna find out. Um, there's a gold and then there's like this duochrome that goes between gold and pink. So the gold, I'm gonna put the gold, I guess right next to, so that's just the regular gold right there. And then this next color, I'm gonna put it on the other side. This duochrome is so pretty. I had so much fun playing with this. So this is the duochrome here. Hello, can you focus on my hand? So see how it's like pink and gold and orange? It's really, really pretty. So those, I had so much fun playing with these. But the funny thing is I did all these like fun looks using those colors and then I also played with obviously lots of the other colors in the palette, but you guys went completely bananas. The one day I was in a hurry and I was like, okay, I've got to do a quick look. I don't have a lot of time to do my makeup. So I'm going to do a one eyeshadow look. I ended up using two shades, but I really, okay, let me just get to the point here. I took this shade, this kind of murky, bronzy, let me just show you what I did. It was, it was so funny how like wild everyone went, went with this look because I did not expect that reaction, but it's kind of this like murky, I don't know if, see how it's kind of this murky color? Okay, so I'm gonna put it on my hand. It's like a bronzy, brownie something. I don't know, I was like, okay, so I put this all over my eyes, this color right here. I put it all over my eyes and I like blended it all the way up pretty much. Like not all the way to my brow bone, but I blended it like a bunch. And then I'm just like wiping all the extra eyeshadow on my legs so I look ridiculous right now. <laughs> but I don't have any napkins or anything and I'm gonna be touching all my decks later. So then, this shade, which I don't know how to describe this shade, this sparkly dimensional thing that, but there's usually one of these in every one of Pat McGrath's um, Mothership palettes. So I'm gonna show you. I took this, I'm not gonna be able to duplicate the effect exactly. And then I sprayed it. So this is what it looks like over top of that color. Cause I just dipped the same finger. I sprayed it with a little bit of water and then I blended it over top of that brownie shade. And I'm doing this on the back of my hand so you can see. And that's the effect. It's like this really like wet looking, it looks so great, look at that. So that's what I put on my eyes that day. Um, I'll put a picture up so you can see what my eyeshadow looked like. Cause I was, um, I was happy with how it came out. I'm like, whatever, it's fine, it's just pants. Um, <laughs> so now I've got eyeshadow all over the back, back, back of my hand, but this is what we do in these videos. Anyways, I loved that look and I ended up wearing it a bunch the rest of the month and then I did the same thing with other colors. So I did the same thing using this kind of berry tone all over and then put that on top. I also used this kind of like mauvey color and did the exact same thing. Blended it all over just one eyeshadow and then used this special shade on top. It became like my favorite thing to do. I just, I loved it. But it's not a surprise because I did the same kind of thing um, when I was working with Wayne Goss's palette that I really like because he's got a shade kind of like that that's like really, Pat McGrath's is funny because it feels really kind of weird dry and almost, I'm not gonna describe it well, but it feels very dry. Uh, but when you dampen it just slightly and then you blend it all over, it's just, oh my gosh, it's gorgeous. Anyways, that was so much fun. And um, so yeah, I'm moving on from that palette for July, but I had so much fun. Look at how shiny everything is. I'm not gonna lie, there's a part of me that just freaking would swatch makeup all day long because it's so much fun to do. Just get my fingers in it and like do swatches. Uh, Unicorn fan members, if y'all ever want like an eyeshadow swatch party, we can totally do that. I don't think I would subject to the public to that, but my channel members, I sometimes do crazy weird stuff behind the scenes with because I can get away with that. But I love swatching eyeshadow. Okay, anyways, I'm gonna move on now.
that was that was makeup and beauty was that eyeshadow palette and the uh, nail polish. I will link the Pat McGrath eyeshadow palette down below. My recommendation, do not ever pay full price for these. They're hideously expensive. Um, she has 30% off sales like a couple times a year. And I know at least one of, when I got this palette and a couple of my other palettes from her, I got them during one of those big sales. And I think it lined up with around the same time as the Sephora sale. So just don't pay full price because you can almost always get her big mega palettes for cheaper. She's got a newer one called uh, Utopian Dream that I, I really kind of want. I just can't justify it because they're so expensive and I have so much eyeshadow, but uh, I love her eyeshadow. It's a lot of fun to play with. Okay, that's it for makeup. So I know I was there for a little bit. We're gonna, we're gonna move on now though. Let's talk about TV and movies. So I did get to go to the movies this month, or well, yeah, in June. Uh, Peggy and I and uh, Steven, our youngest, we went and saw Doctor Strange Multiverse of Madness. Uh, if you've been following the Marvel movies, that one is, it's, it's the most different of, oh, I've got eyeshadow all over my stuff now. That's fine. We'll, we'll be okay. We're going to be all right. It's fine. Anyway, it was real. Let me, let me try to focus here for a second. Doctor Strange is a really fun movie. It does deviate, not deviate. It follows the storyline and it, it has some really cool like cameos and it has some really cool stuff in it that sort of ties into some other Marvel things. I don't want to spoil anything in case you haven't seen it, but it was a lot of fun. It was the darkest of the Marvel movies that I've seen, so it felt the most um, dark. <laughs> I'm out of adjectives, but I had fun. We tend to see all the Marvel movies, so we stay up to date on the universe, but I'm really excited to see the Thor Love and Thunder, which comes out this month. It comes out this month. So we'll probably wait for the theaters to settle down, but I definitely want to go see that. So I'm sure uh, we'll take Steve again. We try to get all four of us together, but John's usually quicker to go to the movies than we are. So he's usually seen it by the time we get around to seeing the, the current Marvel movie, but we'll probably go with Steve and see Thor at some point in July. Yes, that will probably happen. But I also been watching some TV. So I guess I did find some ways to find some me time. It just didn't look the way that maybe it normally looks. But I watched Bridgerton season two and it was wonderful. I loved it. I love Bridgerton. I cannot wait for the next season. I fell in love with the show when season one came out and season two has been out for a while. So I'm really late to the game, but I really, 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 really was excited to sit down and watch it. Basically, I just had to say to Peggy, cause she watched season one with me. I was like, are you interested at all in season two? And she's like, no. And I'm like, good. Cause I'm going to watch it without you. <laughs> When we do watch a show together, I don't want to like go to the next thing if I think she wants to watch it. Like I want to wait for her and her and I coordinating to be able to watch a TV show is difficult to do. So I was like, once I knew I had the green light, I was just like, I'm in it. So I watched it. It was so fun. It was so good. I really enjoyed it. And the other thing I ended up doing in June, this was entirely instigated by Dustin um, because he was talking to Danny and I and asking us if we'd seen the latest season of Stranger Things. And I was like, no. And I'm pretty sure I'm not going to remember. I have a terrible memory for like details and shows and movies and stuff. So I said, I think I need to rewatch seasons one through three so that I can watch the newest season uh, and remember what all the things are that have happened. So I basically binge watched uh, seasons one through four in June and had a lot of fun. Season four was like, I cannot wait for part two, which is, is it out now? Is it out now? It might be out now. It might be out now. Uh, so that's exciting. I'll have to look that up. I'm very excited. But part, the first part of season four was, was really good. And I heard that the second part of season four is only going to have like two episodes, but they're going to be really long episodes. So that could be really cool. So that brings us to food. Uh, there's only a couple things of note from June that I've been really, really, really enjoying that I wanted to specifically highlight. One are these tonkatsu noodle bowls that I got from Costco. I'll try to put up a picture. They're really, really delicious. Like you think they're just like a basic noodle bowl, but they have a ton of flavor. They're really, really yummy. And they have this like spice packet, like spice sauce packet, which I'm pretty sure is probably just sriracha, but you can like customize the heat level of your soup, uh, which is super fun. I've been enjoying those. And also we went and visited with Steve at his place in June and popped into an old donut place. So the, the neighborhood that we used to live in, there was this donut place called Duffin's Donuts in the area. And they had donuts, but they also had these really, really yummy sandwiches. And so we picked up donuts and sandwiches and took them to Steve's place for dinner that night. And it was like perfection. The donuts were so good. <laughs> they had these ones, they were called, they called them buttermilk donuts and they weren't they were like a really 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 crumbly melty buttermilk scone and a really crumbly melty cake donut kind of had a baby that's kind of what these were like and then they had either a raspberry or lemon filled and 
They were incredible. They were so, so good. Uh, definitely need to make a run for those again in the future because they were delicious. It's time to talk about books now. So there's only one book I read <laughs> in June. I was not reading a lot because I was watching a lot of TV <laughs> as per my previous section where I talked about all the TV I was watching. But we did have our Unicorn Fam book club and uh, Unicorn Fam, by the way, is the channel membership. I know I've been babbling about it here and there, but that is the membership. It's kind of like a Patreon. It just stays right here on YouTube. And one of the things we started doing um, late last year is we started a casual book club and we alternate fiction and nonfiction and we vote on the pick and the pick for, uh, and we do each book for two months. So we have lots of time. It's like a low pressure <laughs> book club. But for um, May and June, we had The Stars Within You, uh, A Modern Guide to Astrology by Juliana McCarthy. This was such a great book. So the funny thing is, I heard about this book a long time ago when Dustin recommended it to me. And I think he recommended it to a bunch of people on his channel, actually, as like a really good beginner-friendly get-to-know-your-astrology book. I had so much fun reading this through and I marked it up like crazy. I basically went through and highlighted like all the section headings and like everything. But then I took a pink highlighter. Let's see if I can find an example. Okay, wherever it was pink, it's because those were my chart things. So like sun and cancer. And I highlighted all the sun and cancer things with a pink highlighter. And then I also went through and highlighted any of Peggy's things in blue, which I realize is kind of silly, but this way, as I was going through the book, and I did this kind of upfront, I looked at our looked up both of our charts, and I went through the book before I read it and marked everything up, all the section headings, so that as I read the book, and I got, if I got to something that was in my chart or in Peggy's chart, I could kind of pay extra attention. And then if it happened to be a thing that was in both of our charts, like for example, we have the same rising sign, um, I would do a really silly thing where I, co-highlighted it. <laughs> Where is it? Yeah, here we go. So you can see an example of that. I kind of co-highlighted it, pink and blue combined. And it was a really cool effect. And I really had fun doing that. Anyways, worked through the entire book. This is an excellent book for getting to know what's in your birth chart and like ha starting to form a basic understanding of what that means for like your life and your personality and that kind of stuff. This was so much fun. And one of the things that I did is I created this little notebook and I put my chart on one side of it and then if you flip the whole thing over to the other cover to the other cover to the back cover and flip it I've got Peggy's chart so I have both of our charts on here and then what I did and this was really fun <laughs> this is the only book I read so whatever I went all ham so I obviously I made a bunch of notes in this book throughout studying um, the stars within you and then when I was done with reading the stars within you I got out my heavenly bodies where is it my heavenly bodies astrology deck and this is a really great, really great astrology deck for studying. Um, I'm sure it can also work great as an oracle. I have not used it that way yet. But I got this out and I just laid out. So this has cards for all the houses, the planets, the, the major aspects, um, and the signs. And so I just pulled out every section of my chart one at a time and I took a photo. So for example... I would pull, because my son is in Cancer and it's in my 10th house, I pulled Sun, Cancer, and 10th house cards and I laid them out side by side and made note of what the keywords were and then wrote some notes about that in this little book. And then I did the same thing for my Moon sign, my Ascendant, my Mercury, Venus, Jupiter, Saturn, Mars, Uranus, Neptune, Pluto, and then I also did my North Node, my South Node, my Chiron, and then I did my major aspects. And the cool thing about that with this deck is that, so like if you pull Mars, it gives you some keywords at the bottom for Mars. So it says, move forward and defend self. Um, and then same thing if you pull the sign, here's like Gemini, and it says curiosity, intellect, and networking. So if you pull the cards side by side and you just read the words, you get a basic understanding of what that could mean in your chart, which is super cool. And it does the same kind of keywords on the aspects. And like there's not a single card in here that doesn't have keywords, which is great. So if you're playing with like trying to understand the basics of your chart, it was a really fun exercise to go through and like lay out pieces of my chart, take a photo of those three cards and like consider their keywords and consider their meanings and like... It was just, it was a lot, of, it was a fun exercise. So I did that in June when I was finished reading A Stars Within You. And it was actually after finishing my study with the book that I booked my astrology reading with Kyra, which I mentioned earlier in this video. So that was a ton of fun. And I kept all of this astrology goodies in one, my, this is the OG, this is an OG 
Peggy bag. Uh, this is the two pocket. I talk about these two pockets all the time. This was a design. She happened to have some scraps of this beautiful leather and she, um, trying to figure out this design. She'd done a couple prototypes and this was one of them. And this was when she was using floppier materials. It's not as like nicely firm as her, um, later versions of this, but she did have this beautiful leather wrap, um, style closure on it. But this was the perfect size to hold my stars within you and my little notebook. And so I carded all of my astrology study stuff around in this beautiful bag. So this was also a favorite from June because I just really enjoyed having keeping everything together. And since then, actually, these continue to live in this little kit because I feel like if I want to look at or do work on my chart, having these things together ready to go so I can just pull them out and start playing is has been really handy. So they're just gonna stay there now. But that was really fun. And we had, of course, our members only uh, Unicorn Fam Book Club live stream wrap up. We also had that in June, so that was a lot of fun. But that was a really fun book to work with. That was kind of, that was where we were going with that. So other random things I have been enjoying. So we talked about the book, On to Randoms. That's, that segue happened automatically, but that's where we're, that's where we're at. <laughs> so other random things I've been really enjoying. So I got, this is, right at the end of June, really, I got a smartwatch. So this is a, is that what you call these? I think it is. This is called the Mi Band. It's sold on Amazon, is crazy cheap. Cheap. This is the Mi Band 6. So the reason I haven't had one of these um, smartwatches or like fitness tracker kind of things before is because I have, as I've talked about on the channel before, a very, very low tolerance for metal. Um, I'm incredibly nickel sensitive. I'm sure there's something else in there because I can't wear even um, stainless steel often is a problem for me. I am very sensitive to metals. And so watches are a problem. I can't wear watches because they always have metal on the clasp, um, anything like that. And the Fitbit and all of those other ones, they all have the same problem. They all have clasps that have metal on them and that makes them a deal breaker for me. So I didn't actually look to this because it was the most affordable smartwatch. I looked to this because it's made of, it doesn't have any metal. There's some sensors on the back of the watch that can check your blood uh, your pulse and stuff like that. Um, but they're actually covered in a little bit of glass and the band is completely metal free. It's like a, it feels silicone. I don't know that it's like medical grade silicone, but it is a type of silicone, but even this little clasp is plastic. There's no metal, um, which I'm sure is one of the reasons it's cheaper. But for me, it was like, oh my God, finally, I can actually use a smartwatch. And this has actually been a lot of fun. Um, I got it because I partly, because I wanted to track my sleep. Uh, I was super curious about that. And I liked the idea that I could get um, notifications, like I could set reminders. This will vibrate, so uh, I can set reminders for things. It can buzz when it's time for me to give Bruno his dinner and his insulin. Um, I have my alarms on here. I can remind myself about upcoming events. Um, it's been really, really handy and I've only had it for like a week at the end of June, I think. Um, I also was able to set a custom wa watch band. Oh, I have to take this back off to show you because it's super cute, but it's a picture when Peggy and I got our, our key and heart tattoos. I don't know if it's going to show. It's gonna disappear before it'll show, but maybe you saw it. Anyway, it's super cute. So you can put custom photos on your band there, or I mean on your watch face, and I just put this back on. I'm gonna have to, and it's waterproof. Uh, you can't put it in like hot water, um, but you can swim with it. You can do all that kind of stuff. The hot water apparently will break down the glues in it. But it's like 40 bucks US for this thing. So I will link it down below. Uh, there is a newer one now called the Mi Band 7. It's a little bigger, but my understanding is that this one has way better. The Mi Band 6 has way better battery life, but it's got a ton of functions. I can like, I have timers. I can check the weather. Like I said, I can get notifications on here. I, it has a Pomodoro timer, which anybody who knows me and like my personal life has probably heard me babble about Pomodoros. It's a, uh, and it's a technique to stay on, t on task. Basically you set a timer for like 25 minutes and you focus for those 25 minutes. You do nothing but you, the task you're doing. And then when the timer goes off, you have take like a five minute break and you typically in a Pomodoro will do three of these and then you'll take like a longer break, right? It's named after a tomato kitchen timer, which is the person who created it, created the system was using a tomato shaped kitchen timer. Anyways, I love the Pomodoro and there's a Pomodoro app on here, which makes me really happy. So you can do Pomodoro timing. Um, you can track, of course, your workouts. You can set alarms. You can control, I can control my music on my phone um, or my YouTube. If I'm watching it will help. I can pause it and unpause it. There's a stress tracker. There's, like I said, heart rate and blood oxygen and all kinds of other fun stuff. But for like 
40 bucks. I was not expecting to enjoy this as much as I am and use it as much as I am, but it's been really, really handy. Uh, and I've had no skin reactions to it whatsoever, which is incredibly exciting. Another random thing that I want to share with you is also a tech toy. Well, a tech useful gadget. Um, this is actually something that I have been using a lot and have been using for months and months. This is actually my second set. So it is these headphones. So these are the sound core these are Soundcore Bluetooth headphones. I, uh, the reason I ended up with the pink pair is because I love pink. Hello, they're so great. Uh, these are headphones that do have active noise canceling and they are incredible. I need really good quality headphones when I'm doing my editing because that is how I play back my videos and check the sound quality and like make sure everything's good and having good headphones made that job a thousand times easier. It's easier to hear things like, I don't know, I snurf, like sniff. <laughs> I like sniff or I cough or something or one of the dogs makes a noise and I wanna edit that out. I, I try not to be too obsessive about my editing but having headphones where I can clearly hear everything that's happening goes a long way. I had a pair of these in black. Um, they're still in the house. I ended up handing them down to Peggy so that I could get the pink pair. <laughs> Um, but I freaking love these. The battery life is insane. They sound so good. They're the kind that have these really soft, these are like memory foam um, ear cuff things. And this top part here, this is also memory foam. These are so comfortable, um, but there's, con there's a touch control. You can switch between noise canceling mode, which is really blocks out external noise, which is active. It's like an active noise canceling. You can have that mode on, or you can have normal mode where you can kind of hear some stuff that's happening around you. And there's also um, an ambient mode, which is my favorite feature. I love ambient mode. With ambient mode, you can, you basically just long hold one hand on the right cup and it turns on ambient mode. And ambient mode basically uses the microphones and the headphones to sort of amp up the sound outside of your headphones. So it, it, it creates pass-through sound, which is really excellent because if I'm editing, I'll turn that on a lot of the time so that if Peggy talks to me or something's happening with the dogs, I can hear it. I don't like feeling cut off from my environment. Sometimes I will use active noise canceling if I really need to focus, but I prefer to know what's going on around me. So I like that ambient noise feature like a lot, a lot. And there's like pause and play and uh, volume and all that kind of stuff on here. But I use these hours every single day. And my last pair is still holding up great. Like I said, Peggy's using those now, but now I have the pink ones and they're super cute. They do have a microphone. I have taken phone calls on them and they're good, but they come with like in like a really nice hard case for travel and they're really great. And I just realized I'd never talked about them, but I use these every single day and I often am using them a lot. They're also good for gaming and stuff like that too, but um, I don't know that they're the best sound for like like I wouldn't say if you're like a MMO gamer and you're wanting to like do something where while you're raiding or something, these might not be the best because you usually need a better microphone, but I love these and they're Bluetooth and they have great range. And I just decided I wanted to tell you guys because I, it's one of those things that like I love and appreciate all the time, but because I use it so much, I forget that it's like a favorite. Does that make sense? Do you have things in your life like that where you're like, I use this all the time and then I forget to mention it because I use it all the time, so it's just like a part of my life. Yeah, that's these headphones for me. Okay, that brings us to Dex. We're finally, we're finally at Dex. I have a basket next to me. I'm gonna talk about everything I used in June. So buckle up, let's get into it. So I mentioned earlier that Exploring Tarot was doing that video series on the Forest of Enchantment. So that totally inspired me to get out my Forest of Enchantment. So I kicked off June working with this deck. It's by, it's by, this is a beautiful deck. It is by Lunea Weatherstone and Marela Allwood. I'm doing that off memory. I might be saying it wrong. Uh, it's a Llewellyn deck. It's mass market. It's beautiful. It's got this fairy tale world and, and vibe to it. It just, it's transportive. It's, it's just beautiful. And it was so much fun to work with this in the early part of June. And I used it next to the fairy tale Oracle by Lucy Cavendish which this is such a really, really good Oracle deck guidebook. Like I really enjoyed working with the deck, but I especially enjoyed working with the deck with its guidebook because this is one of those, um, this is one of those big eyed um, Jasmine Beckett Griffith decks, but I freaking love this deck. 
for starters, pulling a single card to sort of set the tone for my daily reading and then using the Forest of Enchantment tarot next to that was such a beautiful practice. I've done it before. I really, really enjoy it every single time I pair those two decks. And the Lucy Cavendish guidebook is so good. It's so good. Like, so for every card, you'll get um, a little quote that um, sort of comes from or sort of summarizes a little bit about the story. So here you have the 12 dancing princesses and the card is enchantment. And then you get this just incredible write-up. You can tell that Lucy Cavendish is passionate about fairy tales. I also have the big hardbound book um, that goes into a bunch of fairy tales and has some of the artwork from this deck in it. I have talked about that in a show and tell in the past and it's still one that I'm working through. I just love to do a single story out of there, but that book is excellent because you go through the story in detail. It's like a rewriting of the story by Lucy Cavendish. And then there's a whole section breaking down kind of the witchy symbolism or the magical symbolism that's in that story and like how it correlates to a magical practice or to, you know, modern witchy life, I guess. It's really a cool book. So I have that kind of in my head when I'm working with these, but it's a delightful pairing. Aesthetically, the two decks are not aligned except for the fact that they're both fairy tale based, but they work beautifully together. I think they look beautiful together and I thoroughly enjoy both of those decks. But then the whole middle of June, yeah, pretty much the whole middle of June. So I, at least two weeks, I was working with the Chicoli Tarot and the Chicoli Oracle. Oh my gosh. Okay. So, so I, I mean, stay tuned because I'm going to be doing, I'm going to be sharing on this channel, a full discussion, walk through gush fest, about the Nicoletta Ciccoli Tarot and Oracle. So this is what the backings look like of the of the tarot. And then the frontings, the frontings. I just fell head over heels in love with this artwork. Um, I cannot describe it, and you're gonna hear me try when I do the walkthrough, but I have, this deck brings out some feelings in me and it's so easy for me to read this deck intuitively. And I thought that the meanings weren't going to align with the artwork, but they do. I, and, and Easter egg, the guidebook is written by Lunea Weatherstone. Yes, the same author of the Forest of Enchantment Tarot. And she did an incredible job with these curated arts and aligning them with the tarot meanings. I mean, like, is that not a great seven of swords? Yes. Yes, it is. It's just a beautiful, it's a beautiful, powerful deck. That being said, and I'll be saying it again, I'm quite sure, but it also has some, some content that I feel like could be potentially a lot, potentially triggering, um, because it, it combines the sort of sweetness of youth in a way, the seeming innocence of youth or of youth minded folks with a lot of shadow and darkness and danger. So those two things combined is a really interesting combination, but is one that could be really problematic for some folks. So know that going in, but, and I think that's even more true of the Oracle deck, which I got right after I got the tarot and fell in love with it. So I worked with them together in June and they were a very powerful combination. So again, I'll be talking about these more in a dedicated video, especially because I put my own keywords on these cards and I'll talk through that process and kind of how I came about that. But I had such an incredible time working with these as a pairing. I mean, obviously it's the same art, it's the same artist, so same art style and similar themes. So putting these two decks together was such a powerhouse combination. I got the matching Peggy bags because um, they're just, they're destined to be together. But these were so incredible for me to work with. And not only did I work with them for myself, but they ended up being requested the tarot anyway, was requested by the Unicorn fam for our uh, Magical Unicorn and Up member readings, which I do once a month in the membership. So I used the Chicoli tarot in that member reading session and it was incredible. It was just really powerful. I felt like I got the messages I needed very quickly and easily and it just flowed. And that's been my experience with this with these decks. It's just, it's exciting. It like excites me in general about tarot when that happens, but when it happens or you feel especially bonded to a deck you maybe didn't expect to bond to, it's just like angels are singing. Like, oh, yeah. Anyways, that was my experience with the Chicoli tarot. Uh, I also went out on a limb in June. Now this was not reading for myself. This was client work. This was experimenting. This was playing. But I read for the first time for other people with the writer Waite Smith. <laughs> like, what? Who am I? Who is this girl? Uh, so this is the original writer Waite Smith 
tarot. It's what it's called. It's called the original Rider Waite Smith, and it's put out by a company called Debris, who took the original artwork that's, as far as I understand, out of copyright, the original 1909 uh, Pamela Coleman Smith deck, and they sort of refurbished it. I don't know if that's the correct term. I'm pretty sure it's not, but they cleaned up the lines and the colors, and it's just a really sharp easy to look at copy of the Rider Waite Smith and it's on this luscious um, linen cardstock. And I was looking at it and I just was feeling this appreciation for it. So I decided to try using it for client work in June. And when I had a couple of readings that I felt like, you know, it was really well aligned with. And I actually had a good time with it. It read perfectly fine. I was able to do what I needed to do with it. But I didn't have the experience I was hoping for, which for it was for it to feel like really comfortable. It felt familiar, but it actually felt really limiting. So here's what I've realized. So I've been reading tarot off and on for like 20, 24 years ish. <laughs> like I started reading when I was like 19. I'm trying to do math. So, uh, so, but I didn't start with the Rider Waite Smith. I learned about the Rider Waite Smith and the Rider Waite Smith's meanings, but I didn't read with the Rider Waite Smith. I was reading with alternative decks. I was never drawn to this deck. I thought it was kind of boring to look at. So I just never learned or worked with. I never even had a reading from somebody else using this deck because all of my friends in the circle that I was learning tarot with were also using alternative decks. So this deck, while I know its images really well and I'm comfortable with them and I know what, what's symbolized here and I've been exposed to them thousands of times over the years, I've just never read with it. <laughs> I've used it for study. I've taken it to workshops. I, I get it. But what I realized when I read with it was that the Rider Waite Smith is always in my mind when I'm reading tarot. I can't disentangle it from my mind because I've been exposed to it so much over the years. So what I realized is that when I read it with any deck, um, I guess unless I'm reading specifically like Marseille, but even then it's kind of in my brain still, right? So when I read with any deck, the Rider Waite Smith is still there. It's still in my brain. So I pull a Four of Swords, some part of me instantly registers what the Rider Waite Smith Four of Swords looks like, right? So it's always there. It's always a layer in my brain when I'm reading tarot. But when I'm reading with an alternative deck, I have this instant image of the Four of Swords in my brain. And I also have whatever image is on the card in front of me. So I get kind of two cards every single time I pull a tarot card. I have the Rider Waite Smith image in my head and I have whatever image I'm looking at. And sometimes other decks are in my brain too, right? So what I realized when I was reading with the Rider Waite Smith is it's like I'd cut my usual cont like amount of information in half. So instead of having two cards in front of me, I just had the Rider Waite Smith. I was missing that other piece that I read with. And I was like, oh, like, yes, I can read this. This is easy, but I'm missing the other layers that I love so much. And it was a really cool kind of reading epiphany to realize that I love the Rider Waite Smith and what it has and what it contains. And I, I think looking at it is neat and like all that kind of stuff. Now I have a different appreciation for it. But reading with it is like taking away. It's like trying to put an outfit together and you only have shirts. Like I want pants too. <laughs> Does anybody else you know what I mean? So it was really eye opening. I was like, oh, okay. Uh, and ironically, what I paired, so moving on, <laughs> ironically, what I paired with it was the uh, Oracle of a Radiant Sun, which was the first deck that I thought of when I was trying to think of what would pair. And I actually asked in the Supportive Tarot Facebook group, and I think the first person who commented was like the Oracle of the Radiant Sun. And I was like, yeah. So I had this handy as an Oracle deck for my client work. I don't think I used it, but once, maybe twice. Um, but this is an excellent pairing for the Rider Waite Smith. I didn't really show it that much. I'm sorry. So the Oracle of the Radiant Sun, which I talked about earlier in this video, it's an, a traditional astrology based deck. So every card is a planet and a sign, a planet and a sign rather, and a keyword. So it's a really great deck. It does read very predictively. It doesn't feel like just one of those astrology study decks. It feels like it's its own thing. Um, but yeah, that paired really well, actually. And then the next week, so I worked with uh, the Chicoli Tarot in the middle two weeks of June. And then the third week of June, well, I guess that would be the fourth. There was five. There were five weeks in June I worked with decks. So the fourth week in June, I actually worked with two decks and I also had kind of a surprising experience with. The first was the Witchling Academy Tarot. I loved getting this deck and going through it and reading this, reading the guidebook cover to cover and exploring the main character Charlie's story as she goes through this like Witchling Academy experience. So fun. Such a great world building tarot deck. But the funny thing is when I started working with it, I was like, it's mostly a Rider Waite Smith clone to me. 
<laughs> so I was reading with it and I was like, it doesn't go its own way quite as much as I thought it did, but I still really, really enjoyed reading with this deck. I keep holding the cards back here and then you can't see them, I'm sorry. Um, it's a really adorable deck. I did talk about this deck in my last Mass Market Madness video, which I will try to remember to link somewhere for you. Uh, it's a lot of fun. It Again, it has this kind of like, yeah, it's like a Witchling Academy. The suits tell a story. Um, the majors tell a story. So there's a lot of fun narrative stuff in here that is, that it's, it's just fun to work with. And I was trying to think of a good uh, Oracle deck to pair it with, and I came up with the perfect pairing, and it's the Believe in Your Own Magic deck by Amanda Lovelace. When I tell you this deck disappointed me so much working with it in like real time, because I think I wanted this deck to be something it wasn't. So I do love the artwork on this deck. It's very body affirming. There's pretty much exclusively curvy bodies in this deck, which I think is super fun. And aesthetically, this worked really nicely next to the Witchling Academy. It's kind of modern, um, it's feminine, and it's very affirming. But it read, it read like an affirmation deck. And I thought, I guess I thought it was much more of an Oracle deck, but actually it reads like a pick-me-up deck. Like I need an Oracle hug, I need an affirmation, I need to be boosted right now. And it didn't read like a general Oracle deck. And that disappointed me so much, and even though I love this deck. It disappointed me because I wanted it to do more than it did. And I thought it was capable of that, and it just did not hit that way. No matter what card I pulled, I felt like it wasn't the kind of card that could kickstart a conversation with my tarot, which is typically how I use Oracle decks in my personal practice. I use them to kickstart a conversation with my tarot deck. And this one just was not doing it. It was just giving me this little like pat on the back. And it's like, okay, that's great. Thank you for the boost. And there's a lot of these cards that feel like they're very focused on like, I know you've just been through it, but here's how it's going to be okay. And I'm like, but I, I haven't just been through it. It's, it's, it's a normal day. Like it's fine. <laughs> like I almost felt like it wasn't talking to me because it was addressing stuff I wasn't currently going through. So it just was not landing right. So jury's out on this one. I don't know. I, I haven't reached for it a lot since I got it. I love it in the sense that like, I love the artwork. I love the themes explored but it feels more like a self-love affirmation style deck, which is fine, but I also have a couple of other decks like that that I already love, so I'm conflicted. You probably will see this in a future this or that because I'm still thinking through what my relationship with this deck is gonna be going forward, but I'm still very excited about the Cozy Witch Tarot, which is coming out by the same artist, so I'm still gonna be keeping my eyes on that, but that one just didn't, it didn't hit right. But by far, other than the Chicoli Tarot, this next combo, which I worked with in the last week of June, was my favorite deck combo to work with in a while. I had such an amazing time with these decks. So the Tarot that I worked with in the last week of June is the Phantasma Tarot by Paulina Fay. And this deck was such a joy. It was so full of depth. The readings I got from, with this deck for myself were incredible. The guidebook is so good. The color vibrancy in this deck is wonderful. It feels like it's got nature and magic and whimsy and play, but also seriousness. It doesn't feel like it's boxed into any one sort of category. It feels really magical, but also really deep. Um, I really enjoyed the messages and I really enjoyed the artwork. It's it's, it's got enough of the softness of Paulina's art, but the depth of color that I was missing in some of her other decks. And this one might be giving Joie de Vivre a run for its money because I, I just effortlessly had such an incredible time using this deck. It was the star of the show for me for the second half of June for sure. And I paired it, because I was like, what do I pair with that deck? I paired it with the Sacred Creators Oracle. Um, this is a great deck. This is the mass market edition by Hay House. It's awesome. I love it. It is on the crappy Hay House cardstock, which the more you shuffle, the more like kind of warped the cards kind of get. I don't, it annoys me, but I always, I always kind of complain about it. So I'm going to try not to go on and on and on, but this is a great deck and it paired beautifully with, and I got really great messages from it. It paired really, really well with the Phantasma. And this deck, even though I feel like in some ways it's also an affirmation style deck, the way the affirmations are written, the way that the words are written, I feel like it does kickstart a conversation with my tarot cards. I don't know how to explain how this did that so well and Believe in Your Own Magic just didn't, but this feels like it just did a better job <laughs> of starting that conversation. Like one of the cards I got in the last week of June was this one, which says manifesting and doing. And the message in the guidebook was all about like 
not just manifesting, but also doing, and not just doing, but also manifesting. And that was a great kickstart for a tarot reading because then I was able to ask my cards, like, how can I do more of this, more manifesting and more doing? And I was able to ask a question and then got a tarot card and then was able to ask a follow-up question. And it all was really great. And it worked really good with this deck. And I do like that because of the art style of it, it pairs so well with so many different things. So when I'm stumped for a pairing, this one stands in real well. So I love that about the Sacred Creators. This is fun. I wish it was on better cardstock, but it is what it is. I do enjoy working with it. So that, my friends, is everything I have been working with and enjoying and playing with and just kind of want to babble about for June. Thank you for watching this with me. I guess I was wrong to think I wasn't going to be here for like an hour because here we are. But thank you so much for hanging out with me. It means so much that you put your eyeballs on this space. An extra big thank you to the Unicorn Fam. You guys help support the channel and help me do more of this. And it means a lot that you do that. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And to everybody, may your magic always shine from the inside out. Bye, guys.